I'm going to start with our chairman, if that's all right with you. What do you think? Yeah, so that we keep on time. Right, so I'm Nuria Garcia. <laughs> nice to meet you all. And these are the co-authors of this work. So first of all, I want to thank John Oven for here, because uh, he's the one who initiated this and the one that knows about all the mass of the ATT. And then also I want to acknowledge James, James Ipton at the back, who has done most of the experimental and also the interpretation of the data, and Nina Mendes, who didn't manage to come to this conference. Uh, so moving on to that, I don't know if you are familiar with GITT. I put this introduction, yeah, can, most of you say yes, so I will be quick here. GITT is a very powerful technique. It's been used very often in lithium-ion batteries, and this is the thing I illustrate in this slide. A GITT is called galvanostatic intermittent titration technique, and that's all right. <laughs> And it's a technique in which we apply short current pulses followed by relaxation, and then we monitor the evolution of voltage during that, and then we repeat this all over and over. So as we apply this current pulse, we induce a variation of the surface concentration of our species. So for lithium ion batteries, for a negative current pulse, obviously we will be inducing some lithium, we will be inserting some lithium ions into the host. So that produces a local change in concentration, but then this concentration is change is spreads out through the whole electrode, and at the end of the relaxation we end up with a constant concentration change throughout the lithium insertion electrode. Um, so that's why at the end of the relaxation we observe a constant change. I mean, we observe that the final potential after relaxation is different from the initial potential. So that will give the equilibrium potential of the electrode. And more or less, we have the same thing with lithium sulfur batteries. So now, the main difference here, we will also apply a current pulse and then a relaxation, and we will have the reduction of sulfur, producing some polysulfide species. And the it's all the same. The main difference is that now the concentration change takes place within the electrolyte, whereas over here, before, sorry, let me use this. <laughs> whereas before, in lithium ion batteries, the concentration change takes place in the electrode. Um, that's all I have to say. This technique is very useful to get the value of the resistance through the electrolyte, so Matt Lacey has used it a lot to study the evolution of different cells, so that's very powerful. We wanted to get a bit more X information trying to analyze the evolution of the voltage, and that's highly complicated, as I will show you in a second. Um, so, first of all, trying to um, convince you a bit more of why GITT is so important. It's been used a lot on lithium-ion batteries, and this is a beautiful article uh, by Weber and Higgins, get, they set up the mass for this analysis and they demonstrated how this technique can be used to uh, obtain very useful things like the chemical diffusion coefficients of lithium inside the battery material. You can also obtain the equilibrium voltage profile as a function of the state of charge. And they also saw that you can determine this quantity over here, the enhancement factor is de defined in this way, the derivative of the logarithm of the activity of lithium ions inside the material versus the logarithm of the concentration of lithium ions. So this has to do with uh, how the activity coefficient of lithium varies with concentration, obviously, and it's very important because this enhancement factor produces an enhancement in the actual diffusion coefficient that we measure, and I will talk to that in a minute, uh, at the end, possibly. Uh, so, well, the message that I want to uh, put across is that lithium, sorry, GITT can be very, very useful to understand our lithium sulfur batteries, but it's very far from a step forward to see how to use this technique in a quantitative way. And this is because lithium sulfur batteries, as you know, are very different to lithium ion batteries. And the most uh, relevant difference is that the, we have this extra complication, so we have that the redox reaction takes place in the liquid state rather than in the solid state, and then we have a complicated mechanism involving polysulfide species, so that we have to take into account. And also we have this problem of polysulfide Saturn, you know, polysulfides going from the sulfur electrode to the lithium and then back. Um, 
so our approach is that, well, we have removed one of the, public, uh, one of the complications right away that was relatively straightforward. Uh, we have developed new cells in which we can introduce a lithium selective membrane. We just use an O'Hara glass separator which doesn't allow uh, the passage of polysulfate species. So we avoid the problem of settling. That's uh, not, and then we have worked, we have spent many, many hours working on the derivation of the equations to um, analyze this system. So the thing we have done so far is that we have developed the maths and we have validated that our analysis is correct uh, using a model redox system, ethyl biologen, is one redox system that we know quite well. And now we have done this part and the next steps in our project will be to apply this analysis to increasingly difficult systems up to being able to apply it to actual lithium sulfur cells. So we'll get there and then uh, we will show, hopefully, that we can use GATT to obtain very useful quantitative information of lithium sulfur cell and that quantitative inform information is the mass transport rate of the different polysulfide species. We will be able to tell also about the reaction rate just by looking at the uh, variation of potential during relaxation and we will also be able to determine the composition dependent activity coefficient, which is something very important because, you know, we form a very highly concentrated polysulfide solution, so this is far from ideal. We want to, we, it's very, very important to find out what the activity coefficients of these solutions are. So that's the plan. So um, I'm going to try to convince you that the analysis is correct, and for that we have um, compared the evaluation of the chemical diffusion coefficient of this model system, ethyl biologen, that is very well defined, we know it very well. Uh, so we have used all these techniques to determine that, and at this moment they are all consistent, please to say that, including the evaluation by GITT. So um, this was a long trip. Uh, we had to think a lot, I mean, Thanks God, James is super patient and very, very careful. So we have developed different cell designs uh, in order to be able to get model experiments which we can interpret with confidence. So this is the cell design. You don't have to look at all the pieces. Please just note that in these uh, experiments that I'm going to show here, we are using a glassy carbon working electrode. It's not very common. Um, it's just because we selected it because it's flat and well defined so we can understand what we get. And then just to point out that we also introduced this O'Hara glass cell just to avoid this problem of settling. So polysulfides, they will be confined within the electrolyte that is close to our working electrode, our plastic carbon electrode. So that's all and I give you the summary directly. So uh, using this cell we were able to determine the diffusion coefficient of ethyl biologen. In this particular um, medium, it's, it was just convenient because we have experience with that. It's a highly viscous ionic liquid and that's why the diffusion coefficient is quite small. Uh, but that's not important. The important thing is that actually these values match quite well because the, uh, obtaining the values of diffusion coefficient more accurately than that is very, very difficult. So just to obtain an order of magnitude estimate is already a big achievement. So we were quite pleased with that. I don't have time to go into much detail over here. I just want to show you how we determine this. So these are classical electrochemical techniques. If you want to know anything more about this, just please ask me um, um, during, during lunch or something like that. Um, so uh, this is all very well established. Uh, so yes, you can use all these techniques to determine the diffusion coefficient. Uh, so going over here, Cycle voltammetry, this is the, these are the results. You can uh, extrapolate and obtain the potential at zero current just by plotting potential versus current. And from that, we determined that the peak to peak separation is 63 millivolts. This is very close to 59, uh, which, which is the value that you expect for a highly reversible system. So our ethyl biologian behaves very well. And then just by plotting the current versus a square root of scan rate, we determine the diffusion coefficient. That's easy. <laughs> then chronopotentiometry has already been used much less often, but we can use it as well using the sand equation over here uh, in order which uh, from which uh, we obtain the transition time from the experimental response and then using the sand equation, we determine the diffusion coefficient. 
Um, the last technique is a square wave voltammetry. This is a very sensitive technique, so I, I would say this is the most accurate evaluation. Um, you just use this um, staircase voltammetry kind of thing, and uh, from this you obtain the peak current, and then if you, put it as a, if you plot it as a function of the concentration, you can obtain a quite reliable evaluation of the diffusion coefficient. So now comes the bad news, but you know, we have a happy ending, so they go, don't get too disappointed. The bad news is that we tried to apply GITT to this system and it didn't work. I mean, we will get there. Uh, but the problem is that now we are using a glassy carbon electrode that is flat. And also because of the supplier, is, this glassy carbon electrode has quite a small area. Uh, so what happens is that for this particular cell, we have quite a lot of electrolyte volume for the small glassy carbon electrode that we have. And then we did the experiments and then we thought about this and we did the calculation. So we evaluate that from the charge that we pass through this glassy carbon electrode, this is the change in the concentration that we create in the bulk when you do the current pulse. Obviously, you can apply a current pulse that produces a good change in the concentration at the surface of the electrode because you can control that. Um, just by you know money, just by choosing a correct uh, current. So this is the change in concentration that we expect to observe. But the problem is that you produce this change in concentration at the surface of the electrode, and then when uh, during the relaxation the concentration equilibrates, so it smooths out. And because we have so much electrolyte, we end up with almost nothing, no change in concentration. So that means that we are not producing any change in the potential of the electrode. So we are doing the experiments on the same state of charge all the time because the number of moles that we are um, uh, introducing, I mean the number of moles of reducing biologen uh, to reduce biologen is just very tiny. So we just have to change the cell design, we get there, uh, and we, but in parallel we were doing experiments with a larger surface area electrode um, just, you know, carbon-coated aluminum foil. And this works, <laughs> that's the good news. So this is the cell design, it's slightly different, uh, but the key elements are the same. We use this working el electrode, and then we use O'Hara glass again to confine our polysulfide solution in the working electrode compartment. And these are the results. Uh, so we, um, in this case, uh, we use this other um, solvent, which is more common in lithium sulfur batteries, so we get higher values of the diffusion coefficient, and we obtain quite a good agreement, cyclic voltammetry, chronopotentiometry, also with GITT devaluation, with GITT it's a bit more uncertain, but it's clearly in agreement with the other methods, as I will show in a second. So just um, a bit of an overview, so this is the cyclic voltammetry, you can see quite big peak-to-peak -peak separation here, but this is because we are using very high uh, scan rates. So if you do the same thing, potential versus current, extrapolate to zero current, you get that this system is really reversible. So that's quite good. And then we obtain the diffusion coefficient as before. And using chron chronopotentiometry, again, a diffusion coefficient that is in agreement. And this is the thing that has taken us more uh, time to work out is that then we apply GITT and we first of all follow the classic analysis of GITT data as it is done in lithium ion batteries. And they have demonstrated that, well, what they've done is that they have derived this equation from which you can determine the diffusion coefficient. So that's the first thing that we did. And then you get from this high quality <laughs> experimental data, I have to say, we obtain this value of the diffusion coefficient, which is clearly wrong. Uh, you don't expect, for the case of biologen, you cannot really explain this super large variation of the diffusion coefficient. So we knew there was something wrong, we knew we could trust the data, it has to do with something with the equation. This equation was not applicable to our case, so we uh, had to look into the maths more in depth, and then we, okay, so the, what GITT data has, the main thing is that you can obtain the equilibrium potential as a function of the state of charge from the value of potential after relaxation. Uh, and from that you can determine the change in potential, in the change in the equilibrium potential induced by the pulse. 
So that would be the difference between this potential and this potential from the, yeah? Is that, thank you for nodding. <laughs> so we know that that's very good. This cell is actually, you know, very, very good. Uh, so uh, we can, oh, sorry, I didn't have to explain this whole thing. We can uh, calculate the, uh, we can plot here the values of the equilibrium potential and we can plot on top of that these red points over here, which is the calculation of the equilibrium potential that we expect from the NERST equation. And this is a very good agreement. I hope you <laughs> agree with that. These measurements are correct. The problem has to do with the other part of, 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 of what we need for the equation. So you see in this equation, we are using this delta E relax, so this difference in potential. But we also using the delta E pulse, so that will be the difference in potential induced during the pulse after IR subtraction. I can tell you that uh, later on. Uh, the main uh, thing here is that if we say that this equation is correct and we say that the diffusion, co that the diffusion coefficient shouldn't change because it's a model system, we don't expect any change. This is the delta E t, the, sorry, the delta E pulse, the change in the pulse that we expect to observe experimentally, whereas this is the change in the, in the potential induced during the pulse that we measure. Uh, so this delta E pulse, it has something weird. There is something funny over here. It's not as we expect. And this is because for that equation to hold that is used so often in lithium ion batteries, it's actually is, uh, for a solution redox system, quite often th that equation will not hold because it has this assumption that it's, we usually, experimentally, it's very hard to fulfill. So that assumption is that, well, you go through the whole maths, everything is correct, but the assumption is that uh, for that equation to hold, the change in potential during the pulse has to be proportional to the change in concentration, the change in the surface concentration. And that's quite, usually, for lithium ion batteries, that's not difficult to achieve because you just have to apply a very small current pulse. Uh, for redox system, for solution redox system, that's not so easy to achieve because if you produce a very a small current pulse, okay, you can achieve a small change in the surface concentration, but then the change in the concentration in the, your whole electrolyte is going to be super tiny. You are not going to measure almost anything. Oh gosh, we are running late. Uh, right, so um, this is di very difficult to be applicable for a solution redox system. So then we came up with this other approach is that, well, we don't need that assumption. We can just assume NERST equation, which is really applicable for any solution redox. Uh, so let's use NERST equation and then we use the math that have been derived before, we apply NERST equation and we know the surface concentration of our species because it's been derived just by using fifth law and applying the correct boundary conditions. Um, uh, so that is, so that's kind of the conclusion. Uh, if you do that, if you just apply the NERST equation, you obtain results that match the experiment. So this is uh, for different pulses that James selected. Uh, this is the experimental thing in black and the uh, um, expected variation of the potential during the pulse uh, that we can predict using the NERST equation is this red one over here. So there is a little bit of shift, but it's probably due to um, that the fact that the resistance of the solution is not very accurately estimated over here. It's just a little bit of shift, so we, ha we have to look at the analysis a li little bit more. But you see, the agreement is quite good. Whereas if you had to use the other approximation, that very simplistic equation for the diffusion coefficient, you will have to observe something like that. This is our estimation, the blue one. Uh, so that's the key message. That assumption is not applicable to our system, but if we uh, then use the NERST equation, that we can get a very good agreement with all, um, you know, all the pulses. So that's the conclusions. Um, we now understand much more how to analyze GITT data, and we have validated uh, the analysis using a variety of electrochemical techniques. Uh, we, next, we plan to use uh, GITT to be able to learn much more on lithium sulfur cells. 
just quickly, super quickly, this is one example of how rich GITT data is uh, um, in, in, in terms of information. So this is just some snapshots of variation of uh, uh, the potential during pulse and relaxation. I'm not going into details at all. But yeah, so we can learn a lot, as I said, and then quickly, uh, just to finish, <laughs> and without questions, uh, <laughs> Uh, please ask me later, is that there is another thing we plan to do, just to warn you. Uh, so this thing that I said, the enhancement factor is so important because this enhancement factor produces an enhancement in the value of the diffusion coefficient that we measure compared with what we, observe, what we could observe just from the rate of the um, uh, diffusion of one species correctly. So we will be able to determine that too in lithium sulfur batteries. The maths are over here. We can just obtain the derivative of potential with, a car, uh, with charge, and we will be able to determine that thing. And also, for very dilute solutions, with this technique, we will be able to determine n. So it's here the number of electrons uh, involved per sulfur atom. So that will tell us something about the speciation. So yes, you know, just to tell you that we are working on that. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, so you, you, you plan to use these uh, analytical equations for uh, lithium sulfur also? Because uh, in lithium sulfur you can have uh, different redox reactions and uh, maybe this uh, type of approach is not uh, applicable for that kind of uh, approach. Um, so we have developed the mass to analyze part of lithium sulfur batteries and the rest is in progress. Uh, so this is totally applicable, at least for the early uh, stage, I mean, when the battery is fully charged and we are forming some polysulfides. Once we have some precipitation of Li2S, the maths are different, and we will have to look into that. Uh, John wants to answer, I think. Do you want to answer? Uh, well, I would like to uh, comment that in the lithium-ion situation, especially with uh, something like a lithium-aluminium alloy, then there's also lots of different reactions on the molecular scale there that we can't even see. But then if we treat it as an alloy, and you can keep, treat this as a, as a two-component ion, um, ion a system and define the activity in that way, and everything works out the same. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank, thank you very much. much. Mm -hmm.